In the last lecture, I introduced uh, a number of uh, surface micro machining examples, such as a resonant gate transistor, a polysilicon cantilever, and a polysilicon bridge, doubly uh, supported polysilicon beam. Uh, pin joint and uh, free joint. Okay, so pin joint only allows a rotation. And this uh, free joints allow both rotational and uh, translational movements. And we also uh, briefly discussed this uh, uh, polysilicon tones. And the polysilicon micro motor. This is probably the most famous uh, surface micro machine example. We discussed uh, the process of a polysilicon micro motor based on MAMP's process. We discussed uh, the processes in, in detail. We also discussed a uh, polysilicon pin structure. Well, this structure can be used to uh, make out of plane uh, 3D structures. And today let's uh, discuss uh, more surface micro machining examples. This slide shows polysilicon comb drives. As we can see, can see in these two pictures. The interdigitated electrodes look like combs. Well, that's the reason we call this type of devices comb drives. Uh, the, the central comb, well, these, two, these two combs are movable. They are freestanding and supported by this uh, frame structure. And the outer, okay, uh, these two outer combs are stationary. I we call them stator combs. They anchor to the substrate. I say they don't move. And by applying voltage to the stator, the central comb, the movable comb, can move horizontally or linearly. Let me show you a video. This is a video I played uh, previously, but let's uh, watch it again. So this is a comb drive we just discussed. All right, this, uh, all right, these two uh, central cones can move uh, horizontally back and forth. Right, the outer cones are stator cones. Right, we can apply voltage right, to the stator cone to drive to drive the central cone to vi vibrate in this uh, along this horizontal. Direction. We can turn on and turn off. So the, this is the, the finger of the. So this is the, the fingers of the movable comb, the central comb. Right? And uh, these fingers are uh, uh, stationary. Right? They are the finger of the stator comb. Okay, any questions? Torsional 
cone drive actuator. Well, the structure of this torsional cone drive actuator is, uh, is very similar to the linear uh, cone drive we just discussed. This is a rotor cone. My uh, rotor cone is a uh, freestanding, and uh, uh, stator cones anchor to the substrate. The rotor cone can be driven to uh, rotate by applying voltage to uh, stators. Right. So the rotor can. can rotate back and forth. This is a torsional cone drive uh, actuator. This SEM image shows uh, micro gears and the transmission mechanisms fabricated using uh, polysilicon surface and micro machining. So those structures are fabricated by uh, polysilicon thin film. And this uh, work was done by Sandia National Lab. We can see the magnified view of polysilicon gear teeth in the right figure. Very beautiful uh, device. Let me show you the video again. It's another video, not the same video. This one. Okay, let's uh, take a look at the operation of, of this uh, my, my gear and the transmission uh, mechanism. Okay, let me play it again. So those are the uh, micro gears. We can see uh, the rotation. Rotation can be converted to linear movement or vice versa by, by, by this micro, micro gears and the transmission. Uh, Mechanism. So we can see that a lot of uh, mechanical mechanisms or structures can be miniaturized using MEM technology. Well, that's uh, the reason uh, many people call MEMs uh, micro machines. Stiction. Stiction refers to the adhesion of freestanding MEMS structures to the substrate or adjacent surfaces. Stiction is a serious yield and reliability concern for MEMS devices, especially for surface micro machine devices. Stiction can occur during releasing when a device is uh, removed from the aqueous solution after wet action of an underlying sacrificial layer. So after finishing the sacrificial action, we remove the device from the aqueous solution. Then the liquid meniscus formed on hydrophilic surfaces pulls the microstructure toward the substrate and the stiction occurs. For example, let's consider a cantilever made by surface micromachining. This is a substrate. I will first fabricate a sacrificial layer, such as the uh, oxide of PSG. Then we fabricate structural layer, for example, part of silicon. 
to choose a different color. We can release this uh, polysilicon cantilever by HF etching. Right, we use HF to etch the underneath uh, oxide layer, sacrificial layer. Then this polysilicon becomes a freestanding way to become the cantilever beam. Then we remove this device or this chip from the aqueous solution. Then the meniscus, the meniscus formed between the cantilever and the, the substrate is a concave, where right? we have this concave meniscus because the surface, the silicon surface right, due to the native oxide is a hydrophilic. Right? We have discussed um, the hydrophilic surface before, right? the contact angle is uh, less than uh, 90 degrees, right? that's a hydrophilic. So we will have this concave meniscus. Then the pressure inside this uh, condensed liquid is less than the pressure of atmosphere. So the meniscus force, right, the pressure inside is uh, smaller. So this cantilever beam will experience a pulling down pressure or the meniscus force or the capillary force pulls the meniscus force or capillary force pulls the cantilever towards the substrate and it cause contact between the cantilever beam and the substrate as is shown in the bottom figure. Right, so the meniscus force or capillary force during the uh, drying process will pull the cantilever uh, towards the substrate and cause uh, contact. And the during, as we just mentioned, okay, during this releasing and drying process, the pulling down of the freestanding structure, for example, cantilever beam, the cause by capillary force. After contact occurs, the stiction is held by Van der Waals force, electrostatic force, hydrogen bond, and so on. So now I have a question for you. When water completely evaporate or when the device is completely dry, when this uh, condensed liquid disappears, will the cantilever bounce back and become freestanding? Yes or no? Why? No, it will not bounce back. The cantilever will still adhere to the substrate. It will stick or adhere to the substrate. Even it's completely dry. Why? Because now the contact or the stiction is maintained by other forces, such as the Van der Waals force, electrostatic force, hydrogen bond. Those forces are not dependent on liquid. And the capillary force or meniscus force is caused by the trapped liquid. Right. So after it's completely dry, the capillary force disappears. Right. But now the cantilever is held, the stiction is maintained and held by other forces. Right. So, the stiction 
is irreversible. Okay. If it occurs, it occurs. Right. It, uh, uh, you cannot reverse the process uh, when it's completely dry. Any question? This is a very important uh, feature of stiction. It's typically not reversible. Right, so again, I want to emphasize that you know, the, the contact, the initial contact is caused by the capillary force, right, by the meniscal force. But the stiction is held by other forces, such as the van der Waals force, electrostatic force, and the hydrogen bond. Questions? Critical lens of cantilever beam. As we can envision, when the cantilever is very short, if we have very short cantilever beam, it is very rigid, the beam is very rigid, and the capillary force is not able to pull it down and cause contact. If there is no contact, then there will be no stiction. However, when the lens increases, the cantilever becomes more flexible, or it's softer. Then the capillary force can pull it down and cause a contact between the cantilever and the substrate and the cause diction. Therefore, there exists a critical lens or threshold lens above which the stiction will occur or below which the stiction will not occur. So this is a kind of threshold lens. The theoretical limit of detachment lens, namely the critical lens of cantilever being is given by this equation. L critical, by the critical lens, is equal to, uh, uh, this is the no, tau to the uh, one over fourth. Uh, three over 16 E. E is the Young's modulus of the uh, cantilever material. For example, for polysilicon, E is a 160 gigapascal. T is the thickness of the cantilever beam. And the G is the, the gap spacing, the gap between the cantilever and the substrate. Questions? And in this micrograph, we can observe that two, the two short cantilevers are freestanding. Okay, these two are freestanding. And the, the longer ones, the three longer ones have stiction. Are they adhere to the substrate? And we can tell the stiction from the color change and also the Newton rings. Right? The Newton rings are caused by the interference of light. And the left figure is an SEM image. Right? We can clearly see that by right, the two short ones are freestanding. Right? This is the third longer one has diction. Okay. This one adheres to the substrate. Right. Actually, that's this one. So based on this microwave, we can we can 
we can tell that the the threshold the threshold lens or the critical lens is somewhere between these two distances, right? It must be between right, these two lenses. How to, I uh, know that, okay, stiction occurs if L is a if lens that greater than the critical lens, and it avoided if L is a less than the critical lens, right? So L, critical is somewhere here. So the two shorter ones have no stiction, the longer ones uh, have stiction. And to avoid stiction, this critical lens should be as long as possible. Right? For example, if it's very long, then all the five cantilevers are shorter than that critical lens, then there will be no stiction. Right? So if we want to avoid stiction, we want to make L critical as long as uh, possible. So how do we increase uh, L critical? It's a critical lens. Right. From this equation, we can see that we can choose uh, a rigid material, a material whose Young's modulus is large, or we can increase the thickness as a T qubit. Okay, so it's uh, fairly sensitive to the thickness. Or we can increase the gap, G, right, between the cantilever and uh, the substrate. Oh, I forgot to mention this. Right? In this uh, formula of critical lens, we also see theta C. Theta C is a contact angle. That's a contact angle, or right, this angle. This angle is theta C. For hydrophilic surface, theta C is less than 90 degree. What if theta C is 90 degree or even larger? But let's assume C does C is equal to 90. What will happen to L critical, the critical lens? If C is a 90 degree, how large is the cosine C does C? Zero, right? And how large is the critical lens? It's infinite, right? L become infinite, then any, any realistic can deliver will be shorter than that critical lens. So there will be no stiction. Right. So we can say if theta C is 90 or even larger, the, the critical lens will be infinite or doesn't exist. This is the, our brain principle of using same layer to avoid stiction. Right, please know that we do not want stiction. Right, when the cantilever stick to the substrate, right, it's not functional. Right, it cannot function as a sensor anymore. Right, so we want to avoid stiction. Right, the same layer we can use same layer right self-assembled mono layer to avoid stiction right the, the operating principle is that the same layer can convert a hydrophilic surface to hydrophobic right mathematically then we know that l critical will be you know either infinite or does not exist. From the physics perspective, right, we can use uh, right, these two figures to explain the operating principle of assembly. 
I'll show you this figure on hydrophilic surface. The meniscus is a concave. So the force inside the liquid is, or the pressure inside the liquid is less than the atmosphere pressure. So the capillary force pulls down the cantilever, okay, cause contact and the stiction. And on, con on hydrophobic surface, or if the surface is a hydrophobic, then the meniscus, the liquid meniscus is a convex. They become convex. Then the pressure inside is a greater than the atmosphere pressure. Then this uh, meniscal force actually pushes this cantilever upward instead of pulling down. Okay, so it's now it's, it's a upward force. Therefore, there will be no contact and no stiction. So that's the, the operating principle. One example is a OTS assembly. OTS uh, is a acronym for octadiesel trichlorosilane. Octadiesel means, uh, means what? It means 18, right? Octadiesel, 18. So this molecule has uh, uh, 18 carbons. 18 carbons, one plus 17, 18, 18 carbons. So a chain of 18 carbon. And the OTS molecule has a trichlorosilane head. Right? Its head is a silicon Cl3, trichlorosilane, right? three chlorine. And the trichlorosilane heads stick to the oxide surface, right? it'll stick to the oxide surface, forming silicon oxygen silicon links. And the film is further stabilized by cross-linking between chains. Right? We know that OTS has a, uh, has a, a 18 carbon long alkyl, alkyl chain. This uh, tail is a uh, uh, 18 carbon long alkyl chain. So now, but after coating this uh, OTS assembly, now the surface, the silicon surface, is covered by a well packed OTS assembly. And the alkyl chains stick out and convert convert the hydrophilic silicon uh, surface uh, due to native oxide to hydrophobic surface. So now the surface becomes hydrophobic, which can avoid uh, stiction. So that's the uh, our print operating principle of uh, uh, OTS assembly. Uh, this figure plots uh, uh, the thermal stability of the OT assembly. Vertical axis is a water contact angle, the contact angle. Right? Horizontal axis is a uh, annealing temperature. Now we can observe that in uh, in nitrogen and the vacuum, the contact angle remains uh, constant. It's about one one hundred fourteen degree. Uh, and to 400 Celsius. So it's a uh, it's thermal stability, the uh, pretty good in nitrogen and the vacuum. But in air, in air and uh, oxygen, the contact angle start to decrease 
at about 100 cells. Okay, so we can see oxygen has a has some big impact on the thermal stability of OTS assembly. This is a process to use uh, same layer anti-station method during releasing. After HF etching, I will dilute HF to remove the uh, sacrificial layer underneath. Then we replace the solution with uh, H2O2 by hydrogen peroxide. Uh, the purpose of the steps is to uh, form a uh, native oxide on the uh, silicon substrate because uh, uh, this trichlorosiline head uh, stick to oxide surface. Right, so we need to uh, somehow oxidize the silicon surface. Then it's replaced by IPA alcohol solution. Uh, then iso-octane solution, then the SAM solution. So in this step, uh, the SAM layer is formed. The self-assembled monolayer is formed on silicon surface. Right? So the surface is a uh, uh, hydrophobic now. Then the process is reversed. Iso-octane, IPA, water, right? And finally, the, the wafer or the chip is uh, removed from the water. And the, during the uh, drying process, the meniscus is a concave, right? So there's a no contact and a no stiction. This is a uh, uh, anti-stiction using sand layer. We can also avoid uh, avoid stiction during uh, releasing using supercritical drying. The basic idea is to take advantage of the fact that in the supercritical region, the liquid and the vapor phases cease to exist as a distinct states. When this occurs, the interface between them disappears and after transition di directly to the gas phase, the gas can be vented without causing any pulling down force. Right. Please note that, by the way, this is a, a phase diagram, right? horizontal axis is pressure, uh, temperature, uh, vertical is a, is a pressure. And we can see the, the three states of a material, right? solid, liquid, gas. And when the temperature is very low, the material is solid. When it increases the temperature, it becomes liquid. We further increase the temperature, uh, liquid uh, changes to gas. When from this phase diagram, we can see that if the pressure and the temperature are above certain critical point, right, this critical point, the material enters this supercritical region. In this region, it's neither gas nor liquid. Right, so the the liquid and the vapor phases cease to exist as distinct states. Then the interface between them disappears. So there will be no meniscus, right? So there will be no liquid gas interface. So there will be no capillary force, right? So the cantilever will not be pulled down. So that's the operating principle uh, of using a super critical drying to avoid stiction. Questions? Let me let me explain this uh, method again using uh, 
this phase diagram. First, we stay in uh, state one, a liquid, liquid phase. The liquid phase transits to supercritical phase by increasing uh, the temperature, right? The horizontal axis temperature. So we increase the temperature. It enters supercritical region. So know that typically pressure need to be uh, kept at a very high value. Then we decrease the pressure. Right? We go downward okay, by decreasing the pressure while maintaining the temperature. So the supercritical phase transit to gas phase right, from state two to state three. With this process, we can see that the liquid becomes a gas without involving air gas interface. It goes through the supercritical region. We use a supercritical phase as an intermediate phase. So there will be no capillary force during uh, this uh, supercritical joining, and thus no stiction. CO2 supercritical joining, carbon dioxide supercritical supercritical joint. We typically use a CO2 as a supercritical medium. Uh, that's because uh, for CO2, the supercritical region is uh, for temperature above 31.1 Celsius and the pressure above 72.8 atm, atmosphere pressure. This condition can be uh, achieved uh, easily in the lab. So we uh, typically use uh, uh, CO2 for supercritical joining. Uh, basic steps of CO2 supercritical joining. First, after etching away sacrificial layer, the, device, the devices are rinsed in DI water without letting them dry. Or it cannot be dry. If uh, the devices are dry, then stiction already occur. Uh, you cannot, typically you cannot reverse the process. Okay, so we have to keep the uh, devices wet. Then the water is replaced, the DI water is replaced with a methanol and transferred to a pressure vessel in which the methanol is replaced by liquid CO2 at 25 Celsius and 1,200 PSI. So now we are in state one. Right, the temperature is room temperature, but the pressure is very high. The pressure is above the critical point. Right? The temperature is still below the critical point. Right? Is below 31.1. The pressure is above uh, 1073. So that's state one. Then the pressure vessel is uh, heated to 35 Celsius while maintaining the uh, 1200 psi pressure to make CO2 enter the supercritical state. Right? State two, we transit from state one to state two by increasing the temperature, right? The temperature now is 35 Celsius. The pressure is still uh, 1200 PSI, right? So it's constant, pressure is constant. Then CO2 is vented, right? We open the valve to vent the chamber. So the pressure decreases at a temperature above 35 uh, Celsius. So the temperature is uh, maintained at uh, 35, so above the critical point. And uh, we reduce the pressure. So now we transit from state two to state three. 
So the liquid, the liquid CO2 become the gas CO2 without involving air liquid in the phase. Right? In this process, liquid and gas do not coexist. Questions? Uh, please note that uh, CO2 supercritical super drying is also used in preparation of biological samples for uh, SEM imaging, uh, the drying of some, uh, the drying of spices, and the production of aerogel. So supercritical drying has uh, many other applications uh, in addition to uh, anti-stiction uh, releasing. Dry releasing. Obviously, we can use dry etching method to uh, etch the sacrificial layer and uh, avoid stiction because uh, the stiction is caused by the, is initiated by the capillary force, right? If it's a, the etching process is completely dry, then there will be no capillary force and no uh, stiction. So this is, a, uh, is another anti-stiction method. Uh, with dry etching, right, no liquid in, is involved. For example, we can use a polymer as a sacrificial material and uh, etch it with a oxygen plasma. For example, TI's digital mirror device is uh, released by dry etching, by this method. Uh, you can verify this. Uh, 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 based on your homework. Another example, uh, we can use a polysilicon as a sacrificial layer and uh, etch it with a bromine trifluoride or xenodifluoride dry etching. Or we can use a uh, oxide as a sacrificial layer and uh, etch it with a uh, etch of vapor. Uh, please note that we typically use a uh, HF solution to uh, remove the sacrificial layer. Right? That's a wet process, right? which can lead to stiction. But if we use a HF vapor, then we can avoid the stiction. Right? As, as this, uh, this figure uh, shows the uh, simple setup for vapor HF etching. We use a uh, nitrogen gas right, to carry HF vapor. We use that nitrogen to carry HF vapor into uh, this etch uh, chamber. So the devices or wafers inside this uh, chamber are etched by HF vapor. So this, uh, this is a dry releasing process, which can avoid stiction. Other anti-stiction methods. We can also use a sublimation to avoid uh, stiction. This method can be explained uh, using the phase diagram again. This is the pressure, temperature, right? solid, liquid, gas. Right? This is the this is called phase diagram. But initially, right after we finish sacrificial etching, we are in liquid phase. We typically use a you know, wet etching to, to remove the sacrificial layer. So it's a liquid. The liquid phase transits to solid by lowering the temperature. So we go leftward, right? Temperature is lower. Then the pressure is lowered. Right, this is uh, achieved by a uh, vacuum pump. The pressure is lowered while remaining low temperature. Right, if we lower the, the pressure below the freezing temperature, 
then the material can transit from solid to gas directly, right? The solid transits to gas directly. This is a, called a sublimation, right? This is a sublimation. And this is sublimation process avoids the air liquid interface and thus avoids stiction. So this is the, is the operating principle. Questions? Uh, examples, right, people have used the water methanol mixture. And this, this is a mess, so it needs special vacuum system with a, a cooler because uh, sublimation typically occurs at, uh, at a low temperature. Okay, so we need a cooler. Uh, people have also used the tea butyl alcohol, whose freezing point is 25.6 Celsius. So at the room temperature, for example, uh, 20 Celsius, right? tea butyl alcohol is a, is a solid. Right. So we can we can do sublimation using uh, just use a conventional vacuum system without a cooler. Right, we don't need a cooler right? because it's a freezing point is a pretty high, like twenty five point six Celsius. Uh, but its vapor damages uh, pumping oil. Right, that's the the disadvantage or issue of tea butyl alcohol. We can also avoid this diction by roughening the surface. For example, as shown in this figure, where we roughen the substrate. So the substrate is roughened. Then deposit and pattern the oxide sacrificial layer. Then deposit and pattern polysilicon uh, structurally, and uh, remove oxide sacrificial layer using HF solution. So it's a wet process. Then during the releasing the drying process, the meniscus is formed. The meniscus is formed underneath the cantilever, right? Which will Pulls, pulls down this kind of lever right, towards the substrate and the cause a contact. However, when it's completely dry, what will happen? When this uh, meniscus disappears, when the water trapped underneath completely evaporate, what will happen? The, the cantilever friction will release. Very good. The cantilever will bounce back. Why? Why well, here we state that the stiction is held by van der Waals force, electrostatic force, hydrogen bonds. All these forces are proportional to the contact area. Namely, if the contact area is a very small, those forces will be very small. So they cannot hold the cantilever. Right? The restoring force of the cantilever itself will be greater than those holding forces due to the reduced contact area. So the cantilever can become freestanding again after, no, after the water or liquid completely evaporates. Questions? By similarly, we can use a beam hole of post structures to uh, avoid stiction. Uh, as shown in this uh, figure, uh, we can make a 
a dimple on the on this upside layer, upside sacrificial layer by partial action. Then we depart the tight and part the second uh, structural layer and release uh, the cantilever by sacrificial action. So during the drying process, this cantilever will be pulled down. Okay, they will adhere to the substrate during drying, but uh, after it's completely dry, this cantilever can bounce back right, because uh, the reduced contact area um, due to this uh, post structure. Right, so in this in these two methods, right, the cantilever will be pulled down during releasing. Okay, so the stiction does occur in these two methods, but Due to uh, the reduced contact area, the stiction can now be held. It cannot maintain it when it's completely dry. Pairing MAM technology. So next, I'm going to give you a uh, uh, introduction of pairing MAMS technology. But previously we discussed uh, a lot of examples uh, based on polysilicon. But now let's, uh, let's uh, uh, switch to pairing MAMS. Pairing actually is a generic name for members of unique family of thermoplastic polymers that are vapor phase deposited by sublimating dimers of perothylene. A pairing and a pairing coating process uh, were uh, developed in, in the 1950s and it, it was commercialized in 1965. And why did they use to protect components and assemblies in medical, electronic, and automotive applications. So it's uh, actually also being used uh, uh, in automotive applications. And to preserve cultural materials and the delicate antiquities. So pairing uh, has, a, has a lot of uh, important applications. This figure uh, shows the chemical structures of uh, three pairing members, pairing N, pairing C, and pairing D. Uh, pairing N is the basic member, and uh, pairing C is uh, obtained by replacing uh, uh, one hydrogen on the banding ring by a chlorine. Okay, that's pairing C. And pairing D has a two uh, chlorine atoms on its uh, benzene ring. Note that a pairing deposition is a, a room temperature vapor phase process, unlike uh, photoresist uh, and polyimide. Right? Photoresist and polyimide are spin coated. And, uh, Pairing is a vapor phase deposited. And this deposition is a very conformal, pinhole free. Conformal basically means uh, it has a very good step coverage. If we have a step, The pairing will hold uniformly everywhere. We have uniform pairing deposition. Okay. This is a conformal coding. The pairing has a, a special pairing C has a low moisture transmission rate. So sometimes it can be used as a 
waterproof barrier. A lower intrinsic stress, smaller Young's modulus, it's a polymer, so it's Young's modulus is much smaller than that of uh, solid state materials, right, such as a uh, hard silicon or silicon nitride. And the uh, pairing is a uh, biocompatible. So it, it has been used to code uh, medical devices or medical implants. It's biocompatible. This is a pairing uh, deposition process. Uh, we start from pairing dimers. Right? There are two units here. Right? So we call it this, uh, this molecule, dimer, pairing dimer. Pairing dimers are vaporized at uh, 170 Celsius. So vaporized at this temperature. And uh, those dimers are broken down into a slip, split into monomers at 690 Celsius, a fairly high temperature, 690. This is, uh, is called a pyrolysis process. It's a thermal breakdown process. So we obtain monomers. Then these monomers enter the deposition chamber and the deposits deposit on the wafer surface and the other exposed surfaces, forming pairing film. But know that the deposition occurs at the room temperature. Right? So this deposition chamber is at the room temperature, right? even though the pyrolysis occurs at the 690, right? but the deposition occurs at uh, no, much lower temperature. Room temperature. And we would reuse the cold trap to uh, remove the, uh, the unreacted monomers. And vacuum pump uh, is used to you know, uh, create a vacuum inside this uh, deposition chamber. So, this uh, is a, a, a typical pairing deposition process. Pairing properties. Dielectrical strength. What does this, uh, this parameter tell you? Well, we have a, uh, you probably recall that we have a uh, uh, quiz question related to this, right? This tells you the maximum voltage the material can withstand before breakdown. The unit here is a volt per micron. Pattern C, 220. So this means uh, if we have one micron pattern C, it will be able to withstand a voltage of 220 volt. Right? This is a dielectrical strength. Uh, dielectric constant, uh, parent N 2.6, parent C 3.1, parent D 2.8. Young's modulus is uh, somewhere between 2 and 3 G, right? gigapascal, gpa. And the uh, part second has a Young's modulus of 160 gpa. So you can see parent has a much smaller Young's modulus. That's a uh, typical for polymer. Uh, elongation to break, pattern C, 200%. Uh, index of reflection, 1.66, 1.64, 1.67. All the three members have a similar index of reflection. Melting point, uh, pattern C, I pretty know that pattern C is the most widely used member. Right? So we focus on pattern C. Melting temperature of pattern C is uh, 290 uh, Celsius, but its glass transition temperature is only uh, somewhere between 80 and uh, 100 Celsius. Right, so the operation temperature of pattern C is uh, limited. 
uh, moisture, moisture vapor transmission at 90 degree uh, relative humidity at 37 uh, degree, degree C, 37 Celsius. We can observe that pairing C has uh, the lowest moisture vapor transmission. It has the smallest uh, no, moisture transmission rate, 0.21. It's the smallest among these uh, uh, polymers. So pairing C is a, a good moisture barrier. Know that uh, the transmission rate, the moisture transmission rate is, uh, is small, but not zero. To have zero moisture transmission rate or to be hermetic, we have to use uh, solid, state, solid state materials or metals. Polymers, polymers are not hermetic. Uh, similarly, uh, to reduce air or gas transmission rate to zero, by uh, solid state or metal materials uh, should be used. You probably uh, notice that many food packages or food bags are made from aluminum foil and uh, polymer composite layers. But uh, that's the reason polymer alone is not completely airtight. So we have to add a metal layer to, uh, to reduce uh, the moisture or gas transmission rate to zero. Questions? Right. Previously, we discussed polysilicon silicon surface mic machining. And now let's, uh, let me give you a brief introduction of parallelements. I will just introduce a parallel material, okay? Now, let's uh, take a look at uh, MEMS technology based on parallel. This is a, a unique low temperature MEMS process. Right, since parallel can be vapor phase deposited at the room temperature, 20 degrees C and it can be etched by oxygen plasma, almost room temperature. And the silicon can be sputter deposited as a sacrificial layer at the almost room temperature and be etched by bromine trifluoride or xena difluoride, again at the room temperature. Photoresist can be spin coated as a as a mask layer or sacrificial layer, right? it can be removed by oxygen plasma or acetone. And the metal thin films can be sputtered, evaporated, or electroplated. Know that all these processes occur at the temperatures below 120 Celsius, okay, 120 degrees C. Actually, the, the, the process has the highest temperature is the, the hard baking, the hard baking of photoresist. For that step, we, we need a baking temperature you know, close to 120 degrees C. Let's compare parallel surface mic machining with a polysilicon surface mic machining. 
in traditional polysilicon surface micromachining, which is shown in uh, the above figures. Oxide or PSG is a sacrificial layer. Polysilicon is a structural layer. Impairing surface uh, micromachining Photoresist is typically used as uh, the sacrificial layer, right? PR. Right? Photoresist. And the pairing is, uh, is a structural layer. Right? So we can clearly either see the a difference and the similarity between you know, polysilicon surface mic machining and the pairing surface mic machining. And for Parallel surface mic machining, the process temperature is below 120 degrees C. Right. The spin coating of photoresist occurs at uh, low temperature. Right. We need to bake, actually, uh, we need to bake photoresist. That process needs, uh, uh, needs a temperature around 100 degrees C. Right. Parallel is uh, deposited at the room temperature. Right. So this, uh, this process is a low temperature process. In comparison, right, for polysilicon deposition, or oxide deposition, we need a uh, fairly high temperature. But pairing surface mic machining has a challenge. What is the challenge? Stiction is more severe because of the small Young's modulus of pairing. The pairing is much softer than polysilicon. So stiction can occur much more easily for pairing cantilever. But that's some, some challenge. That's the challenge we have to uh, overcome for Pairing uh, surface machine. 